Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is, well, June 7th at about noon. I am just getting this live here for you guys. Welcome. I'm Dr. Nicole Christie Moore here. I am going to talk to you today about migraines and headaches, kind of the difference between the, the many different forms of them. Um, and we'll just kind of answer some questions as needed. Um, a lot of people coming into my office come in and they're like, well, I don't know, is it a headache? Is it a migraine? I'm not sure of the difference. Um, people who have things like cluster headaches are going to be like, oh, I have cluster headaches. And they know exactly what it is and usually why it's caused, but not typically how to effectively help keep them at bay. So I will be sharing my screen here in a minute. And while I do so, I will give a quick introductory. I'm Dr. Nicole Corsi Moore. I've been practicing since 2015 as a chiropractor. Um, and I, here we go. And I have a practice here in Roseville, Minnesota. I have been trained in massage therapy, chiropractic. Um, I have 300 hours of Carrick Institute training in functional medicine. I have not yet set for my board, so hopefully in the next few years I will recap on everything in between having babies, having a practice, um, and be able to go sit for my boards for those and pass them. I am now just finishing up with my functional medicine um, certificate as well and considering going into clinical nutrition. So anyways, without further ado, let's talk about headaches and migraines. I hope you can hear me out there. I think you can. I get kind of excited about this, but because it can be so in depth, um, I'm going to try to keep it really light so that we can learn as much as we can um, together here so I can share some information um, about migraines versus headaches and how to differentiate the two. So they are actually called cephalgia. Um, headaches are something that causes pain in the head. Um, so when you look at it, you look at different types of headaches. Um, over on the left there, you have migraines with an aura where you see things, migraines without an aura. You have eye strain headaches, right? So you might need reading glasses. You have dysautonomia headaches. So your brain and your eyes are not matching up. So you're not seeing things similarly. And that can be really hard on your brain um, to differentiate. You have tension headaches. So if your posture is poor or... You're at a concert and you're head whipping all weekend, or you know, if you're part of the 80s rock band, whatever it was, cluster headaches. Um, those are really intense. You would know if you have those. We'll go over those. Um, sinus headaches, right? So you have a sinus infection and they have sinus pressure and they cause inflammation. Aneurysm headaches. So if you're having a brain as aneurysm, um, that can cause pain as well or hemorrhaging in the brain. Um, withdrawal headaches. So such as caffeine or other stimulants, um, and sometimes depressants as well, such as alcohol. So there's many different types of cephalgia or headaches. So uh, it's a big problem. I'm not going to sit and read off this slide, but if you look at the cause of this, it's mostly neurologic. So 90% um, of us have a headache in our life. Um, you can read through this, but it's a significant amount. Now, if you can pinpoint why you're getting headaches, usually you can adjust what you're doing so you stop getting these headaches, right? Um, so when it comes to testing and diagnosis, basically you don't have to go to an MD to identify. Obviously, if you have um, an aneurysmal headache, if you go into a physician of any sort, whether it's your um, chiropractor, Otherwise, you know, possibly your physical therapist or you just end up going to your MD because your head hurts so bad. If it's an aneurysm type thing, they are going to send you for imaging and they are going to diagnose it and make sure that you're not bleeding or that they catch something severe. Um, the other stuff is going to be self-explanatory, right? So if you have a migraine, they can have an aura so you can be seeing things or they cannot, right? They're usually one-sided. Um, usually, if you look up on Google, you're going to get a good description on what that is. But the diagnosis is performed by a history of what is going on. So 
if you come in to somebody like me, a chiropractor, primary care physician, um, we're going to go, okay, when did this start? How did this start? Is it common? Have you had these before? What triggers it? What makes it go away, right? So we go through all these questions, and this helps us gather the history of why you're having a headache. Um, Self-reporting questionnaires is going to help us draw out some of that information. Um, a QEEG, so when we look at the brain, right, we, we set you up on a QEEG machine. Some, some of us have that in our office. I do not, but some do. And when you set that up, you can see where is the cortical dysfunction. So that's kind of the awareness of the brain, the outside of the brain that has a dysfunction, right? Um, you can also get PET scans, so the PET scanning, um, an MRI, um, a lot of other things. But those are usually second, secondary, tertiary, um, quadrary. Those are going to be, hey, let's try caffeine. Hey, let's try an adjustment. Hey, let's change the ergonomics of your computer. Oh, you slipped and fell um, when you went on vacation in the ocean and really kind of went through the rinse cycle. Um, so you had some musculoskeletal complaints. So it's better to start with that and then go into scanning, um, especially because most, most of our headaches and migraines are gonna be self-explanatory. So if you're not typically getting headaches or you don't usually have a headache and you get one, that's gonna be a red flag. You definitely should go to get that checked out. If you've had a headache and you've gotten it checked out and it feels similar to that, typically it's gonna be a similar type headache. If you've had headaches your whole life and it feels very, very different and it came on quickly and there's no reason and it was the worst pain of your life, I would also get it checked out again, okay? Um, headaches versus migraines. What is the difference? Um, why don't you take a second and grab a piece of paper and quiz yourself? What do you think the difference is between headaches and migraines? So a migraine is usually unilateral, one-sided, right? It typically can be with or without visual disturbances. Sometimes it can be without pain. And when it's without pain, you might have other effects like you feel dizzy or nauseous or your speech gets um, changed or you, know, you can't really put words to what you're trying to do. So sometimes it can look like a stroke. Um, Sinus allergy and ocular headaches. This is going to be kind of in our sinus areas, right? So above our, our eyes, we have a couple sinuses. Right below our eyes, we have a couple sinuses. Cavities, I should say. And then we have the ethmoid and sphenoid ones um, as well, a little bit deep to that. Um, and those usually flare up and they can cause a headache as well because when you have inflammation, you're gonna have local or focal inflammation and that's gonna cause pain in that area. That can also make us want, you know, to squint, squint eye, our eyebrows down, or, you know, you're just, you might be unaware of this and it's causing a headache. Tension headaches, it's like a band, like you're wearing a baseball cap, right? So that's gonna be up through the temporal area. Um, it's commonly both sides, starts at the eyebrows, up into the head, um, a lot of times in the back of the head as well. Um, a cluster headache kind of feels like a stabbing, right? When you look at um, cluster he headaches, you're going to have more of a neural pain or neuralgia, right? So it's going to be like shooting or extreme um, versus a tension headache, which is going to be either like a band or tightness or um, a constant pain would be a good description of that. Sinus allergy and ocular headaches, they can make your teeth hurt. They can make your ears hurt. Um, they don't need to have congestion. They just need inflammation in there. And then like we said, the migraine, you're gonna have it on one side. All right, so what are our symptoms? So pulsing or throbbing, let's go to the left. If it's pulsing or throbbing and it's on one side of the head, 
it's usually a migraine. If it's pulsing and throbbing, but it's not on one side of the head, and you have other symptoms, then we're gonna go to a migraine. If it's, I know this is hard to go through, pulsing or throbbing, not on one side of the head and no other symptoms, then we're looking at a headache, right? Um, did you hit your head? Did you um, pass out and lose consciousness and hit your head? Did you, I don't know, there's so many different reasons. Is your blood pressure really high and you burst a, a artery, right? So now you have some type of blood issue going on. Um, these are all things that we consider. Um, when we look at, oops, let's see if I can. I'm trying to find how to move me. I'm thinking the one on the right is going to say, crap, there we go. Okay, here we go. So if your symptoms are achy or pressure, if it's in your forehead or kind of in your head, then you're having a headache. If it's not and you have other symptoms, then we're looking at a migraine. So these are all kind of just um, little things to go through to help you at home understand the flow of a headache versus a migraine. All right. So like we talked about before, they're usually on one side. They pulsate and they're severe. Now migraines can last a good three days and they're they can have nausea, they can have um, photophobia or phonophobia, so hearing or visual issues, right? Um, they can really, really, really take you down for a couple days. 20% um, of the patients, the attacks are preceded by transient. So neurological symptoms are gonna most likely be migraine. When you have speech impediments, when you have sensitivity to light, sensitivity to loud sounds, um, these are gonna be more tending towards a migraine, right? There are neurological issues. Um, a lot of people have different, like if they catch their migraine at a certain time, they can change it. Um, sometimes it's hormonal, sometimes it's from trauma, so like concussions, right? Sometimes it lasts a little bit of time, sometimes it lasts a long time, depending on what you do to it. Um, there's a lot of times a genetic component, 50% of the time actually, which is higher in the migraines with aura, that's what the MA stands for, than the migraines without aura, which is the MO. Um, this is being researched heavily and is coming up with a lot of good answers for most of us physicians. Um, if you have a migraine, but you don't have an ache or a headache with it, you can also see that a lot of people are dizzy. They have incoherent speech. There's a video coming up that makes me laugh every time. Um, they can have numbness or tingling in the face or neck, paralysis, tinnitus, a ringing in the ears, shaking, vomiting, blurred vision. So these can all happen or one happen or um, it just depends on what's going on neurologically for each patient. So here's that video. Very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very Darrison bite. Let's go ahead, Terrace Chase, and let's go to the head to pet. And the grab. Now, I don't know if you could hear her, but it was very pronounced. She could not get her words out. Um, I wonder if my speech was something. Let's see. Uh, all right. Anyways, so hopefully you can see that. Oh, why does it keep going? Anyways. Let's watch that again. Sorry. Now watch her lips. 
Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very there, there from fight. Let's go ahead, Paris Page, and we'll show that she has a text. Now you can tell just by how she's speaking that she understands that she's not able to say the word, right? So when you're not able to say the word, then you're not able to actually um, enunciate what you want to get across, right? So if I started slurring my speech and saying, the box was on fire and ran to the store, and I'm talking to you about migraines, um, you would be like, what? It's, it's kind of that stroke mentality. Like a lot of times they feel like that's, maybe they're having a stroke. So the neurophysiology of headaches and migraines. What do we know about this? Why do people sometimes um, get migraines with or without headaches, right? So sometimes why is their speech imped impediment? <laughs> speech impeded, why, is, why are things happening that our brain can't deliver to our mouth or our body or that creates pain. Well, we know that they can be mechanical, right? So we talked about that. Like if your cervical vertebrae are out or um, if your muscles are really tense because you had a big lifting event or something happens in your upper cervicals or even down into your cervicals or thoracic spine, um, front of the neck, back of the neck, mechanically, it can change the blood flow. It can affect the neuro, neuro, neurology of your um, body as well as chemical. So we look at chemical responses, right? So we look at different um, neurotransmitters. We can look at um, autoimmune diseases, um, specifically like ALS or MS, um, a lot of things going into the brain or the central nervous system chemically because the blood brain bar barrier is not working efficiently. We can also have chemical reactions such as just local neurotransmitters, um, epinephrine, neuroepinephrine, um, whether the sympathetic or parasympathetic nervous system is in overdrive, causing different blood flow, right? Or we have aldosterone, which is a hormone, right? So we jump down into hormone issues. So we look into the change of hormones in the body, specifically females, but most also males. Um, the neurological system, right? We look at the neurology of things. And we look at the innervation. You know, does somebody have CTE and they have head trauma and they're a football player and now they get, um, they never fix the issue and they get headaches all the time and they've had it since high school. Or that one blow, right? They tell you all about it and that's what they, they had to quit football at that point. Um, or dancers that, or um, ice skaters that hit that face. You know, there's a lot of different things. Um, physical, you know, that can cover a lot of different things, right? So if you're physically sitting for a long time or any of that stuff, vascular, we talked about being part of a chemical thing, right? So sometimes when we have poor posture, or we have poor ergonomics, we're going to increase or decrease the vascular flow to our brain, which is then going to cause pain, right? Um, ocular. So if we have visual disturbances, uh, meaning our eyes don't track with our brain, we can have major issues, right? So think about this. If you're always wearing double vision glasses and you feel like you're seeing double vision constantly, your eyes are not going to be able, your brain is not going to be able to keep up with what your eyes are doing. And that's going to wear out over an hour, two hours, three weeks, four weeks, five years. And your body's going to try to do it what it can, but when it gets tired, then it can cause headaches. And they can be physical or they can be vascular. Um, they can be hormonal or neurologic or chemical, right? So you can have the stabbing shooting pain, um, any of that stuff. Inflammatory. So you look at inflammation. We have a lot of autoimmunity. We have a lot of... Um, disease processes like diabetes that happen, right? So when we look at inflammatory headaches or causes of headaches, we can look at that pathway, the cytokines and the interleukins and all these cascades happening and our body can't stop it. It can, you know, can try to help it and it can try to dampen these things, but a lot of times it just will create that headache. So we look at the trigeminal nerve. Um, it's our fifth cranial nerve. So we have three parts to it. 
right? So it talks about it here, and we have more of the chin and the side of the head, you know, the face, then we have kind of the midsection, then we have the forehead into the nose. All these three areas are innervated by three different branches, one V1, V2, V3. Um, when you get sensation from these areas, specifically uh, that are affected or cause headache, you can actually say, I have trigeminal neuralgia, right? So this is a headache due to uh, cranial nerve five being disrupted or inflamed or infected, right? So you get a lot of people who have let's say shingles and they get an outbreak on cranial nerve five. When you see this happening, um, you can actually see inside the ear a lot of the times that somebody on their tympanic membrane will have shingles outbreak. And if they have the symptomatology of a cranial nerve five, uh, trigeminal neuralgia, then you can conclude that this is gonna be one of the causes of that. Um, there's so many causes of nerve pain. We're just kind of going to brief over that. So the connections of tri the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve 5, is going to be what is posted there, right? So we look at the muscles, the SCM, which has those X's on it. Um, you see on the side of the head right there, and that is going to be the sternal um, component. So we have two different muscles that make up that very large sternocleidomastoid. Um, one is attached to the clavicle, and the one with the axis is attached to the sternum, and so that's why it's named that, and the mastoid is up towards the ear. So when we have trigger points in there, you can see that you're going to be affected in the red blotchy areas. So this is a type of headache that's very common, and a lot of times we'll see upper cross syndrome be the cause of this, or it's just a mechanical thing that you can change ergonomically and then you can get massage and adjustments or acupuncture or PT and you can help really uh, relieving these types of headaches. So this is common to see in this type of trigeminal neuralgia. Um, okay, what else does it say in there? Ba -ba -ba -ba. Perfect. So commonly this is mistaken as a tension headache. Okay. So the cause of migraines. So headaches usually have more of a physical aspect to it. Migraines usually have a more neuro neurologic aspect to it. Um, so the mechanisms are usually a little bit less unknown or less known. Um, they're trying to find out more and more and that's where functional neurology is coming from. So functional neurology is starting to sink a lot into the research and show that if we can track what the brain is doing, we can correct where the aberrancies of the brain is not performing well, and we can get the metabolism of the brain where it should be. So you take out certain things and you add things in, and then you get certain exercises to help train the brain. You can actually cause um, a migraine to happen. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with Dr. Schmo, Dr. Jeremy Schmo. He's a functional neurologist here in the Twin Cities, um, has a great clinic here and helps a lot, a lot of people. When I was in school, he had graduated, I think a year or two years before me, I can't remember. And one of my classmates said, you know, you've been getting migraines five to seven days a week and you're puking and all these things are happening you really should investigate a functional neurologist. And Jeremy ended up coming in and teaching one of our classes. And so I asked him, I said, hey, can I come in and see you? He said, yep, great. So I started making appointments, I started seeing him. Um, he actually pinpointed with a VNG that I had had multiple concussions when I was younger and that my brain just wasn't firing properly, right? So there's a few things going on. So he did a couple eye movements with me and I was gonna go throw up in the garbage. And then he said, nope, hold on a second. And he did a couple more things and it totally reversed that nausea, which in my mind, I'm thinking I just had a baby. I, you know, I'm not in good shape. I'm taking 30 credits a trimester. I'm traveling, I'm working and I have an infant at home. There's a lot more going on physically. Well, chiropractic adjustments didn't work anymore. 
massage therapy didn't work anymore, rest didn't work anymore. So when I saw him and he could actually trigger that, I thought, well, I thought it was hormones my whole life that I had migraines. And he actually kindly explained, nope, it's a neurologic thing. You've been having migraines because you must have had some kind of head trauma when you were a child and then had multiple after that. And so your eyes stopped tracking the way they should and you actually, your brain was tired. So I saw him probably for about a month on and off, maybe once to twice a week. Um, my migraines are completely gone. I have not had a full-blown migraine like before. Um, there's a few things that have happened because I didn't get fully treated. Um, I need to go back anyways. So there's a lot of things going on, but because of functional neurology, they're starting to sink more and more into research and seeing what they can do with the brain. It's really, really neat for migraines. Okay, so a lot of times people, um, they talk about migraines in multiple different ways. Neurological depression, the first phase, is basically where your brain gets unstable. It's increased activity and it spreads, right? So you get your aura, right? That excito activity or your prodrome, which is basically like, oh, there's my signal, I'm gonna get a migraine few minutes to a couple hours before it happens. What this does is it actually increases your blood flow to that area and it decreases it in other areas. So it causes constriction in our um, arteries and it increases our calcium exchange. Now this is important because our body likes to tightly regulate things. So when we have an exchange rate change so the sodium equilibrium changes and the calcium exchange rate it changes. That change in itself is what is enough to cause these um, auras or prodromes, right? So this is what happens at first. This is how you know you're gonna get a migraine. Then you have the second phase in our depression of our brain, right? So then after all these changes happen, we have an increase into our regional area blood flow and we have a decrease kind of globally. Then we have chemical imbalance, which it creates decreased blood flow from all the other areas. So let's recap. So the imbalances from phase one, which was exciting, right? Our brain got excited. That creates the imbalances, which decreases or constricts the blood flow, which is that vasoconstriction. And that's what happens when we get those symptoms and then our pain sets in or our migraine sets in. Because now we're starving our brain of blood, which what is carried by the blood? Oxygen. So we have all this oxygen depletion happening because of the chemical imbalance happening and then causing the vasoconstriction. So then we dilate rapidly, right? So that change happens very quickly. So the dilation, and that's where the pain intensifies, right? So now you get this influx. All right, so to kind of go over everything, you have imbalances, which are created by increased excitability which decreases the blood flow and the oxygen, right? So it constricts it. So it makes the brain fail. Then you get all those side effects, the auras, the prodromes, all the sensitivities, right? Because your brain can't keep up. Then we compensate by <laughs> adding chemicals. And then what happens, well, we won't, we're gonna skip the superior salivatory nucleus because most of you probably are gonna go, what? Anyways, then it's gonna actually go into an increase or a vasodilation of blood flow. And then lots of oxygen and lots of nutrients and then you get those headaches. So this is a lot to know, right? So when we get pain and it's associated with headaches, specifically migraines, this is where the pain centers and the autonomic centers come in. So trigeminal and opioid centers, um, which we naturally have in our body and our brain, and then our autonomic centers, which is in our hypothalamus and the brainstem. So 
when we look at variants of migraines, right? So a lot of people get vertigo. More people get vertigo with migraines and with tension headaches, right? So it's almost what, three and a half percent, three and a half times, excuse me. When we look at that, we go, well, why is that happening, right? So vestibular mechanisms, which are usually in our brain, right, next to our ear, vestibular migraine presents with attacks of spontaneous or positional vertigo. Now vertigo is the dizziness or the feeling of the room spinning or you are spinning. You can also have a head induced vertigo or head motion induced vertigo and visual vertigo, right? So a lot of people will be um, stimulating their vestibular system too much, um, which can be due to, gosh, infections or trauma or chemical imbalances. All of these things can trigger that. Um, and this can last up to three days. Okay, do you want me to read this to you? I can if you really want. Okay, so let's just recap here. Vestibular findings tend to be more severe in migraines with auras than migraines without. So when we look through all of these studies, and they've weeded them out for us, the comprehensive neurologic tests that were done, right? So the VOG, which a lot of times VNG is put in there, but they did the VOG, which is a video oculography, um, electro nystagmography, static posturography, and audio ometry in 12 patients with migraines, with the aura in 24 patients without, right? So when they look at all these tests, they do find that both migraine types differ significantly from the control group, but the ones who have more severe vestibular issues are the ones with aura. Just interesting information with that. So 2000 B before Christ, BC, um, basically they drill drill a hole in your brain. You know, they used to do lobotomy or whatever, and they'd kill your frontal lobe. Same thing with drilling a hole, right? So this is what helps with their headaches or insanity. I'm so glad I live now and not then. Okay, so common ways to treat this are going to be with um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, right? So our NSAIDs, or acetylsalicylic acid. 20 to 30% of patients do not respond. Reoccurrence is a common problem. Recommended first line ag agents for migraine prevention is a beta adrenergic receptor agonist, so the beta blockers, l acid, which is anti seizure med, amitriptyline, and flonorazine, so antidepressants, are also unsatisfactory. What they're saying is not many things work. Non-pharmaceutical approaches in the treatment of migraine should not be neglected and even more effective than drugs in individual patients. So what they're saying is drugs really don't do anything. They might take the edge off, but it doesn't do anything. You have to find why you're getting migraines and really approach it that way without drugs. Avoidance of triggers, right? Regular sleep, regular meals, exercise, um, definitely water. A lot of times people will skip hydration. And sometimes if you have gone on some rides, you know, like I just went to Branson, Missouri. So if you've gone on some rides and they twist and turn you, you might have a couple crystals in your ears that just got dislodged and now you just feel a little off. That can cause headaches. Go get it checked out, right? So here's just an example. Not so long ago, many scientists believed that the brain did not change after childhood, that it was hardwired and fixed by the time we became adults. But recent advances in only the last decade now tell us that this is simply not true. The brain can and does change throughout our lives. It is adaptable, like plastic. As neuroscientists call this neuroplasticity. How does neuroplasticity work? 
If you think of your brain as a dynamic, connected power grid, there are billions of pathways or roads lighting up every time you think, feel, or do something. Some of these roads are well-traveled. These are our habits, our established ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. Every time we think in a certain way, practice a particular task, or feel a specific emotion, we strengthen this road. It becomes easier for our brains to travel this pathway. Say we think about something differently, learn a new task, or choose a different emotion. We start carving out a new road. If we keep traveling that road, our brains begin to use this pathway more and this new way of thinking, feeling, or doing becomes second nature. The old pathway gets used less and less and weakens. This process of rewiring your brain by forming new connections and weakening old ones is neuroplasticity in action. The good news is that we all have the ability to learn and change by rewiring our brains. If you have ever changed a bad habit or thought about something differently, you have carved a new pathway in your brain and experienced neuroplasticity firsthand. With repeated and directed attention towards your desired change, you can rewire your brain. That is so interesting. It's so good to know that we can change things. That changes the whole perspective on um, the neurology and keeping people in comas. All right, so how, how do we go to about, about helping people with migraines or headaches? So step one, we have to investigate your brain. We have to investigate why is your brain creating this type of environment, right? So we're gonna take a thorough history. We're gonna go through why, what's going on? When is the worst, when is the best, when did it start? Um, has it changed? All that stuff, right? How is your diet? <laughs> diet, diet, diet. How is your head trauma, right? How many accidents have you been in? Are you a hockey player, football player? Are you a dancer? I mean, do you have an older sibling who punched you in the face all the time? Um, then we go through a comprehensive exam, right? So we look at your vitals. Um, we check your orthopedic exam. Do you have any mechanical issues or physical issues that might be causing your headaches? And we go through your neurologic exam. So why are you getting migraines, right? We check your breathing. We evaluate your ribs. Do they actually um, come out the two inches that they should, right, when you breathe? How are your eye and head movements and how do they work together, right? How's your pupillary response? How are your autonomics working, right? So are you sweaty only on one side and you know, how's your blood flow? Are you having cold hands and feet? Are you um, having one pupil that dilates and one that doesn't? You know, what is your neurological workup look like? What is your muscle tone? How do you actually feel things? Is it, you know, you have heat sensory loss, like heat cold or hot cold? Do you have any of that type of um, loss or hypersensitivities? Then we might also look at labs and other tests, right? So if you come into my office and you have red flags, I'm gonna send you out for imaging. I wanna make sure you're not having a heart attack, you're not having an aneurysm, you're not having anything that could be causing you death or <laughs> comorbidity in the future in the next 24 hours. Um, so those are ways that we actually assess the brain. The non-autonomic test, so our autonomic nervous system is something that's automatic, right? It consists of our sympathetic and parasympathetic tone or you know, nervous system. Um, it is something that we don't control. It's something that just happens automatically. Um, tissue perfusion is a really good test for the autonomics. So yeah, we go through all that pupil response, Right? You should have it equal on both sides and it should look pretty similar to a normal finding. If it is not, it can tell us a lot about, oh, should we do further testing? What should we do? How is this working? How is this not? And then do we need to address how your autonomic nervous system is actually working? Your breathing mechanics. So this helps our pH. When we can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide, 
it allows us to control the pH. We need to be at a certain amount. We won't get into that. Um, this is going to allow us to exchange calcium and sodium and at a rate that our body prefers, right? So we should have about two to three inches of excursion, they call it. So if you look on the left, when you breathe in, your lungs expand. When you breathe out, your lungs contract, get smaller. And that should be the difference about two to three inches. If it's less than that, then we have a mechanical issue, right? So let's check that and make it better. Um, I had head eye movements. So this is basically um, where our training comes in for functional neurology. So if I'm tracking where your eyes are moving and looking for saccades and pursuits, and we're looking for um, any kind of nystagmus at this time, then you're gonna be seeing different things brought out. So if you look at saccades versus anti saccades you're looking at different parts of the brain, how they function. Um, if you start seeing aberrant movement, we have some exercises that we can do and that can address that and really help that in the future. If you find out that there's maybe more metabolic issues going on, so you're not getting fuel delivery, um, oxygen, or even glucose or ketones at night, then we're going to be looking at more of labs, like blood labs, to see are you deficient in something, are you anemic, um, how's your blood sugar, how is everything working, right? So we need to make sure your head and eye movements are working well together so that we can help resolve, if this is the main issue, your headaches and migraines. So when you come to a chiropractor, functional neurologist, somebody like Dr. Schmo or a board eligible one like myself, we will implement something a little bit differently. Um, we implement then eye exercises that can help, specific adjustments that aren't to get the vertebrae or the joints moving, but more for to, more so to affect the brain, um, to drive the brain or to relax the brain. So a lot of times, for example, a patient will come into me and they uh, find me on Google, or they get a referral from a friend of theirs, and they say you have to go try her out. A lot of times they'll come into me and they'll say, "Oh, but C two on the right," and you're like, oh, "Okay." Anyways, we're not going to go there right now, but you find that they like to get adjusted there because that keeps them feeling balanced, but it's really driving a system in the brain that is causing them to actually have that go out again. So what you do is you find the primary cause and you start addressing that. So I had a patient who came in a few years ago. She's still a patient of mine. Um, she just comes in for massage now in the clinic and you know, some upkeep because she's a very busy person. And when she first came in to me, she's like, you have to adjust my neck, my neck hurts. But what we found is going through everything is that she had some neurological things that were, um, it was too much to actually adjust her neck at that time. So we would start with her low back and her legs and her um, feet. And then eventually after about a year, I was able to, um, really do a powerful adjustment in her neck because she had gotten to a point where she's corrected everything and now her body physically needed an adjustment up there because her brain was working efficiently and everything was working efficiently together. She corrected her metabolic state um, and her body was now receptive and it wasn't a chronic issue or a habitual adjustment that she needed. Now it was warranted like, yep, she physically was out there. She doesn't have anything driving it at this point other than the physical part of it. So now we adjust as we need to and she doesn't come in and say, okay, I have C2 on the right. It's not the same adjustment three times a week. It's not, you know, anything like that. So that's where the uniqueness comes in. Um, a lot of times I might just send people home with some brain exercises or some eye movement exercises to do multiple times during the day. And then I'll reassess them after like two to four weeks and we'll touch base and change things up or we'll continue on that pathway. Sometimes it's um, brain based and sometimes it's nutritional based. So there's a lot of different things you can do when you see the right practitioner. I do want to say thank you for spending your time with me. I want to say that was a quick one, but 
are never quick in our office. Um, so if you have any questions or concerns about anything, even migraines and headaches and all that stuff, as far as um, he goes for that, call us, email us, um, write your questions or concerns below. I will be posting this on Facebook and other platforms. So anyways, signing off. This is Dr. Nicole. Hopefully you have a great weekend.